Welcome to the third episode of the Under Your Beds Horror Podcast, a podcast all about horror. Uh, each episode I bring on a guest, they talk to me about three of their favourite horror films, and uh, we have a little chat about horror in general. Um, this guest uh, for this episode is Jared Locke. Welcome, Jared. Well, thanks, man. Um, what brings you to Dublin on this really sunny day? Uh, my new film, 90 Seconds, which uh, I suppose we could describe as a... Maybe our country's first cyberpunk short film. I can't uh, think of any others, any other. No, no, there wasn't. Uh, a futuristic trailer about a surveillance expert, and it was it premiered last night at Underground Cinema. Okay. Um, you have made horror before. I know you've you've made a, you've dabbled with uh, uh, the Boogeyman, a yes. Stephen King adaptation. So it was no surprise to find that one of your top three horror films is uh, another Stephen King adaptation. Uh, the Boogeyman was one of those, what are they called, dollar babies? Or that's something? right, that's correct. How does um, that work exactly? Uh, it's been going since 1982. There is a, a very long list of short stories by Stephen King that mm-hmm. haven't been developed into feature films, so the rights are still available. So you can apply to adapt one of them into a short film, as long as you promise not to commercially exploit it. And if it's approved, you pay $1, and you post that off with your application form. You actually... Yes. Were you, yes. You weren't yes. able to get like the, the euro equivalent. You had no, to, no, you had to track down an American yes. dollar. And all right, them's the rules. Wow. And, okay. Uh, so I did that, and then that's it. Uh, off to the races. I did think at the time though it would start off a a whole wave of Stephen King short film adaptions in this country because I was the first to do it. Mm. Uh, but it hasn't happened. I and I just I Why think, think, I think that's is? really strange. Yeah. Well, somebody said to me. I mean. Um, uh, they, at the risk uh, of being crude, some I, I said I don't I don't know why my contemporaries haven't done this because they haven't got the balls. Uh, but I think, you know, I mean, you make a short film, you you've got to try and give it um, as as much of a commercial edge as you can, just to get it out there, get it noticed. And, and if, if you can stick Stephen King's name on, if oh, you could have oh. yeah, if you could have based on the work by probably the best known author on our planet, mm-hmm. I think that's a good start. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So maybe anyone anyone listening to this. You know, think well. I can talk with that. Mm. Well, that son of a bitch did. So I'll, I'll, I think I'll have a go at it. How, how did you go find it? it? I, I, Stephen King dot com. Okay, and then mm. um, the um, did you feel the the story? Because I, 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 I'm a fan as well, and I would say a lot of his stories are very specific to um, Derry, Maine, yeah. um, that area. Was, was Not there London Derry? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, would you say that is was that okay the the transfer from? Well, I mean the one the boogeyman basically the whole thing takes place inside a psychiatrist's office, mm-hmm. so that could be any town, any city. So it wasn't uh, you know it wasn't uh, specific to Maine. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Any any other plans? Sorry, I'll let you drink your coke. This episode's beverage is Coca Cola. It's too early for alcohol. <laughs> um, yeah, any other plans for any other ones? If you could well, make one, if you could just go, just quickly knock one out. Is there another Stephen King um, short there? I don't know. I, I think it's it's almost you know it's one of those things you try you try it once and then mm-hmm. it'll never be as exciting again. Right. So that the novelty's gone a bit. Um, I'd love to. I'd love to adapt Clive Barker. Mm. I've always been a fan of him. We'll be we'll be coming up on him as well. Yes. Yes. Um, we'll get into. Oh well, actually, first, um, you're. Your feelings toward horror? Would you are you a long time fan? When would you have gotten into it? Really? So I, I mean, I'll I'll risk controversy. I'll risk uh, uh, get my head kicked in the next time I come up to Dublin and go on. Ninety five percent of horror films are shit, right. crap, rubbish, crude. Course that it's a, it's like uh, the film making equivalent of jazz. It's a refuge of the untalented filmmaker because it is. It is a genre like science fiction that has great potential. Mm-hmm. It's almost a, a limitless potential of, of uh, ideas and topics and worlds that you can explore. But it's so badly abused by you know having a girl with with big boobs being chased by a guy with two um, chainsaws. Yeah, and so that's why I think three films we picked this evening um, are you know three of the best of the kind. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you there. I, I do have a a soft spot for a lot of the shite but I will say sure. there is a lot of shite um, yeah. that I find that um, <laughs> no can't can't defend that yeah um, I, I, I still find it one of the most watchable genres 
Evil they're just few and far between. Of they are few and far between. Are, Horror movies, the good ones, the really, good ones. really good ones are going to impress you. That mm-hmm. are intelligent, that are genuinely frightening and disturbing. They seem to come along very there, rarely. There is that thing that any any feature horror film always has a market, especially in North America, the DVD market, where there just seems to be this um, group of people who just snap up anything remotely horror. So I, I'm guessing that's that's why it's such a strong representation of shite horror, pretty much. Yeah. Because um, yeah. the hardcore fans, they'll just watch anything with a little bit of blood in it. Yeah, but you know, it could, it could, you know, you make a good one, it'll, it'll appeal to mm-hmm. uh, everyone. Mm. It can, it can be a much, you know, go in a much, much higher quality. Mm. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be the chains, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It can be the Silence of the Lambs. Mm-hmm. It can be really sophisticated. Mm. Kind of movie. That's that's why it's such an interesting genre. It, it goes from. Texas mm. Chainsaw Massacre, which I am a fan of, but two, yeah, something uh, very culturally significant, like uh, Sounds Alarms, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, your three films, uh, The Shining, Hellraiser. And The Hunger. And The Hunger. Yes. Um, thanks for picking The Hunger. Uh, I saw it a long time ago, but I'd completely forgotten about it, and then I, I rewatched it last night, and uh, yeah, very, very entertaining. Will we start with The Hunger? We will. Um, um, yep, go ahead. It's probably our most underrated film on this list. I mean, it's an awful lot of people still haven't seen it, which mm. is strange. It's probably the most overlooked Tony Scott film. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who hasn't seen Top Gun, Crimson Tide, or True Romance. Yeah. But uh, The Hunger, it's it's almost like they didn't even know he made it. Mm. So The Hunger is Tony Scott's directorial debut, and it is such an about turn that then four years later. Uh, three years later, he made Top Gun. It, mm. That is a complete change. Very true. Um, yeah. Because at, uh, Top Gun is what it is. It is it is commercial uh, popcorn. Um, Jerry Bruckheimer produced, uh, you know, uh, movie. Gung Ho. Whereas The so, Hunger, yeah. you know, is is uh, is sexually explicit. It's artistic. It's visually stunning. <clears throat> it's arty. Mm. You know, it's da- very dark. Um, you know, it's a whole different mm. kettle of fish. When you were giving me the uh, the email of of your three films, there you uh, you linked to the opening of the, hu- of the Hunger, yes. and it's incredible. Uh, it is a stunning opening. I mean, he that was his calling card. He was, you know, he, you know, um, it's hard. You know, if his his older brother, of course, Ridley Scott, and that's mm. quite a, a cast quite a shadow. But you could see, you could almost say, <laughs> I know he's not his son, but he he was a chip off the old block. The Scots. It seems, you know, it really did. It seems like a family thing. They both have a very good eye. Mm. They're they're very adept at cutting, at style, at mm. photography, uh, these things. Tony Scott always seemed to have a knack for cross-cutting, which is something mm-hmm. we see at this, in the opening sequence of uh, The Hunger, which is, for the people who haven't seen it, is in a, a smoky Let's nightclub. Let's just say that if you haven't seen The Hunger, um, yeah. we're saying maybe a lot of people haven't, go, go check it out before listening to the rest of this, because... Uh, you're probably going to give away some spoilers because I'll try. No, I'll try not to. Uh, no, I'll okay. just. I mean, the start of the movie is the, that uh, David Bowie and Catherine uh, Devoe are, you know, stocky, smoky nightclub, and mm. and uh, there's kind Bar of house is playing. That's right. Mm. Uh, Bella Lugosi's dead. Very ironic. Mm. And uh, they they pick up a couple, and they you know they have their wicked way with them. They kill them, mm. and this cross cuts with. Three different things, mm. and it and it builds and builds and builds and builds to a, to a climax, and that's something Tony Scott is very good at. It does this really interesting thing. I was I was looking and going a lot of um, well editors or directors, I'm not sure whose hand it was, where um, the, the the music of Bauhaus is used as part of the scene, and it doesn't go over the the other scenes. It's cut. Oh yeah, it cut out. It cut it, out. Yeah, yeah. It, so it cuts back and forth. Mm. So you're hearing snippets. Of Bella Lugosi is dead, and it cuts to you know, well, music free scenes, and then yeah. cuts back. Yeah. Very, very strange, very jarring, really. Yeah, yeah. yes, mm. at the time for 1983. Yeah. Uh, I think it was, it was a little bit too ahead of its time at the time, and I think that was a problem with it. Most it films a lot would fill that whole sequence up with just that song. Yeah, it, it, it was, it was a kind of the MTV sensibility that mm. was in the film. Even, mm. even probably even a little bit ahead of what we now would call an MTV style. Now mm. it's it is uh, we've seen it before, but at the time it must it was a bit too different. Mm. It met with 
it got a critical hammering in its time. It commercially didn't do much either. Mm. But um, it is a cult movie. Its influence is, um, you know, I walked past a goth today that looked exactly like Catherine DeVoe's character in it. Oh. She had the exact same sunglasses. So it's it's strange how the influence of the movie is kind of seeps into popular culture. Mm. Uh, we, I mean, when you discuss the hunger, we have to, we can't ignore the elephant in the room. Mm-hmm. Which is the um, the, the controversial? Yeah, exactly. Right. The, the, lesbian controver- scene. Controver- the lesbian sex time. scene. The lesbian sex scene. Mm. Very tastefully done. Beautifully done. Beautifully mm-hmm. photographed uh, with opera music. I can't remember the name of it now, but uh, playing oh. in the background. Do you know, I looked um, this up last night. Well, it's also used in that scene with uh, in True Romance with Dennis correct. Hopper. Yes, it's from an opera. Yeah, I, <laughs> I had this, so it sounds smart, but I totally forgot. But but the, it the, was, the flower duet. Right, that's 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 it. I yeah, think. it was. Yeah. So that that was another thing about the film. It was daring. Also, I mean, just as daring was there was a scene in it that was very unexpected, where a child gets killed, mm. and it's very disturbing and it's very frightening the first time you see it because it's not that is not the conventional thing we see. You know, a child no. will always get saved. Ch- children yeah. do not usually get killed. few exceptions. It's all sure. the precinct thirteen, and yeah, that's actually. I've used it being used that kind of um, more exploitively in more recent films. Rambo comes to mind, where um, they really nearly kill a child. But back then, mm. you, to establish this child as a character and yes, it's kind of um, very likable character, and then yeah, just, yeah took her out. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's cold, and then and you find out that it's, it's it was a fairly pointless death too. That's right. That's right. I mean, <clears throat> so in a nutshell, I mean, I think the the hunger represents a very different. Uh, a very different strain of horror movie. It's like it's gone. It's like it's been mutated with a with a art movie with a commercial. With, you know, yeah. it's gone off into. These different, are very different kinds of vampires. Yes, uh, I mean the movie is. You know, excuse my language. The movie is as stylish as fuck. Right. It is. It is beautiful mm. looking. This plot though, sometimes maybe is a little bit to de- to be desired. There is a whole subplot about longevity and about aging and, and how this uh, is connected to blood. Yeah. And this never really quite connects up with the movie in the, as as good as it should. It's, it doesn't it's all, over-explain itself, as in a lot of yeah. our films feel they need to explain this it seemed to be just strand. It seemed to be just in there so Susan Sarandon could m- that meets... Uh, right meets David Bowie. Oh right, yeah, and that, yeah. that seemed to be really just about it. Also, the mm. ending confuses an awful lot of people. People, the frequently asked question on IMDb page four is, "What the hell happens at the end?" So, do we find the uh, again? We don't want to spoil it, but sure, I know how to talk about that ending. We spoil it. Will we go ahead and spoil it? No, we won't. No, okay, we won't. okay. We'll, we'll, we'll let, we'll let. Uh, and, you know, there I, is, I like, is, a, I like yeah. amb- ambiguity, and, okay. and I think, I think, let's preserve the ambiguity of the hunger, and mm. uh, you know, and for the folks who haven't seen it yet, you know, um, let them look, well, dig it up. Maybe we shall say, because uh, mm-hmm. it's a vampire movie, and uh, yeah. you know, and see for themselves, and hopefully enjoy it. Mm. But uh, it is, a, it is one of Tony Scott's best films. Definitely, yeah. Extremely. Mm. Did you and did the um, some of the scenes kind of remind you of Blade Runner? The smoky. Kind yes, of absolutely. He, I mean, as well. I thought. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I think to to make it specific, they like backlighting, mm. heavy backlighting in a smoky room. Mm. I mean, that is their trade. Those those beautiful shafts of light coming in yeah. through a window, and uh, you know, and Blade Runner is full of that. Sure. Obviously, I I wouldn't say that to Tony Scott's uh, face, <laughs> considering well, uh, it was only. What two years, three years after? Well, that's one of their touches, is you know, because they came mm. from advertising. I mean, mm. you you can have a guy sitting in a room like we are now with the window behind us. It's not that interesting visually. No. So the things that they know is, but if you get some smoke in there, let it become dense in the air. Mm. Get a heavy light source coming in from behind. You now have turned something that's quite dull into something that's quite beautiful. Mm. But they have, you know, they have loads of tricks like that because, yeah. you know, they come from advertising. Exactly, right. yeah. Okay, well, we'll move on. Um, will we move on to uh, Hellraiser? Um, based on the Clive Barker uh, novella. Uh, yep, The Hellbound Heart. Mm. Um, Hellraiser knocked me for six the first time I saw it. It was one of those films I was, you know, very young. I sure as hell wasn't 18. Like a lot mm. of people, I didn't sneak in, didn't get into the cinema to see it, saw it on video, mm-hmm. but um, was very struck by it. 
but and not by the gore funnily enough i mean that you know and that is striking too it still is but Mm -hmm. i was struck by the story of it because it was a very good story Mm. and it wasn't all about uh i mean that character who's he's now become known as pinhead Pinhead. is one of the most iconic you know monsters to come out of the 80s he's Mm -hmm. up there with freddy Freddy Krueger, you know, from Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh-huh. Um, but it, it really wasn't about him. No, so no. People oh. forget about no, it. No, it's very much about um, Frank Cotton. Yes, and he's done a kind of a pact. He's done a deal with the devil. Mm-hmm. And they've kind of... The Cenobites, uh, they, they've come back to collect. And it was, and there was also the story about a wicked stepmother. Mm. And there was a, you know, uh, the daughter was innocent and everything. And it was that you know nice fairy tale idea, but the the point is, it was a very good story, it, and it it tipped the ground running right at the start, mm-hmm. and kept going. And I also you know now as an adult and as a filmmaker, I love the economy of it because the movie was one point five million. It kept wow. it lean, it kept it mean, it kept most of it in one house. It didn't need to go out it no, outside no. it. These are very good rules for for making a low budget mm. film. And those those effects still hold yeah. up. Um, yeah, when... I went on the makeup. Yeah, but, let's, let's uh, be honest. Yeah, the um, Frank's regeneration yes. scene is incredible looking. Yeah, all uh, stop motion, reverse oh. photography, uh, good old fashioned in in camera tricks. Yeah, um, there there is an awful lot of uh, um, should we say academic readings that have gone into the film, but where they've gone on and on about the, and I have to, you know, maybe show up my ignorance because this stuff went completely over my head and still does. Okay. Of a sub a sexual subtext of S and M, yeah, and the movie being a uh, parable for AIDS. Oh, okay. I think it's all bullshit. Uh, I think, I mean, the the, the Cenobites certainly do look very leathery, but then mm. again, they're not going to be. Uh, but there is, isn't Frank after some sort of pleasure? Isn't that? Yes, right? that is mentioned. Up? But I think, I yeah. think it's one of those things. If you read that into it, mm. okay. But I mean, you know, excuse me, sure. my cut. my cat is meow. <laughs> Now you want it again, right? Okay. It's interesting. In the American theatrical version, they cut about four or five seconds, uh, not from the sex scene, but right. from the lead into the sex scene. There was a moment where Frank uh, uh, squeezed uh, her wrist for a moment, right. and that means absolutely nothing to me I did not take it in any kind of but it is interesting that the American center picked on it up on it right away did not like it and cut that out they didn't mind flesh being ripped off by the center but they they saw something in that Mm. that they did not like sexual violence seems to uh, hit a nerve with censors overall sure sure but Mm. and this was something let's say it was hinting at something kinky Mm -hmm. and that seemed to get their rackles up I like say I don't quite I don't read that into it I don't think uh, <laughs> it's nothing to do with S and M is about you know they, this guy has done a deal with the devil and so to speak and they've come to collect also uh, an H parable I think I'll be frank about this to pardon the phrase uh-huh. uh, if Clive Barker were not gay I don't think any critics or uh, you know film it would be reading into it so much and say oh oh this is mm. actually. This is actually a parable for the for the fear of AIDS. Or so opinion. I mean, I think I think it goes on sometimes where they take a filmmaker or a writer, and you know, kind of analyze their personal life, and, and it's mm. always they try and read that into the the work. And at, on this case, uh, on Hellraiser, I don't buy it. Right. I just think it's a great movie. It's just a good horror film. Sure, it's... but I suppose it is interesting though how people will look at things, and it speaks to them in a certain way, and mm-hmm. they. They feel it is, you know, they, ah, what it's really about is this. Mm. And at the same time, I suppose, who might say any different? True. I'm sure Clive would sit back and enjoy the debate anyway. I mean, he'll, he'll probably, he yeah. won't agree either way. Exactly, yeah. Um, any more to say that about uh, Hellraiser? Will we um, yeah, I think well, I think there's something that, that has always been, I think, a little bit sad about Hellraiser because mm-hmm. it was, it made a great impact at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, um... And, uh, you know, Clive Barker, of course, was known as a writer. He's still a writer. And he just tried his hand at film directing and he hit the ground running mm. with this great impact of this of this directorial debut. Yeah. But he never seemed to have much luck afterwards. Nightbreed, Night yeah. was Sorry, a, a troubled production. Mm. Um, I haven't seen it. I have seen 
his last film, Lord of Illusions, I thought it was interesting, but it didn't even get a theatrical release in this country. Mm. And he went back to books. He went back to because he was happy there. And to be honest, who could blame him? Because mm. I think he was sick of creative differences. He was sick of budget restraints. And if you look, I mean, I saw um, looks like an image of contentment to me. I saw Clive once, you know, in a documentary, working on a new novel, sitting at his typewriter. And when you think about it, mm. when he sits down and writes a story. He doesn't have to worry about budget constraints or, or pleasing the studio exec, executive or whatever. The only limit he has is imagination mm-hmm. and ink. So, in a way, who could blame him for going back to novels? But I do think that's, that Hellraiser almost represents, in a way, almost, in my mind, unfinished business. Mm. So, I would like to see him go back and mm. do another movie. Well, hopefully we'll be able to see his... Um his uh, original vision of Nightbreed, uh, mm. the, the Cabal Cut, is being shown that's at right. uh, Fright Fest. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's like an error has been added to uh, the original theatrical yeah. cut, which didn't make much sense. Visually amazing, but um, the actual story was a little bit iffy. But um, yeah, hopefully we'll get to see that properly released on a DVD and Blu-ray. Sure, and a, and a remake of Hellraiser is in the works. Really? So is it, he involved? Uh, do you know? Or I think so. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. It's just. So there's still there's still some fresh mm. flesh to be ripped. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Wish we could close on that, but um, uh, we'll move on to The Shining. Talking about films that have been overanalyzed. Um, mm. uh, yeah, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. When did you first see it? Uh, I think I was in my teens. I saw it on uh, it was on Sky TV, mm-hmm. and uh, didn't know didn't know jack shit about Stanley Kubrick at that time. Okay. Uh, of course, knew who Stephen King was, knew who Jack mm-hmm. Nicholson was, and so went and you know to see the film Cold. Mm. I was ambivalent about it the first time I saw it, uh, and I think a lot of audiences were the first time they saw it because it's not quite what you expect. We we expect a conventional horror film. It isn't quite that. Mm. It's very hard to put your finger on exactly, you know, how the movie works and and why. Uh, as I got older, went back to it. And certainly appreciate it now that I'm a filmmaker. We, you know, we, we all appreciate the craftsmanship of it. Uh, for example, I don't. No one could has ever made helicopter footage frightening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he has mm-hmm. in that opening credit sequence. Other directors have to reverse the footage to make it some way eerie. <laughs> but, the ver- um, yeah. Maybe it's the you know maybe it's the music. Sure, mm. that that help, but. There is some, there's something creepy about that helicopter footage. There's something creepy about a stationary shot of a corridor. Mm-hmm. These, there's just something about the film that is, you know, always keeping you um, uncomfortable. Um, I mean, I think. Well, I mean, most people say. So let let's talk about the ending, for example, which uh-huh. kind of, which you know. Uh, a big thing of the shine is ambiguity and you know people well they read this into it they read that mm-hmm. into it it's about this it's about that it's all in his head no the yeah. ghosts are really there Just is so he reincarnated is he I mean yeah. at the end there's theories about the movie ends the final frame is we see him in the old photograph that's mm-hmm. taken in the 30s and, and Wayne and there he is there's Jack and now some theories is that the hotel have now, has now absorbed Jack's spirit that's one theory. The second theory is he he was there in a previous life, mm-hmm. and uh, you know it made sense that these old uh, the demons old spirit has just would rear its head. Mm-hmm. But you know what? And, and thank God Kubrick never answered it. No, and you know sadly he never will. He's no longer with us. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I like that fact that we can we'll make up our own mind. And the thing about The Shining, which it is my favorite horror film, and it and you know it just goes to show that a horror movie it can be intelligent, it can be complex because The Shining really is a beautifully crafted puzzle box, mm-hmm. or we'll say labyrinth. Yeah, that's yeah, the most I famous think. set is <laughs> the labyrinth that makes you keep coming back again and again and again mm. over the years. Every time you see that film, there is something new to it. That's right, you'll look at it another way. Yeah. (laughs) The documentary 237, shown at Cannes, and all it is is all the crazy um, readings into uh, hidden hidden meanings of The Shining from the Holocaust to. This is. (laughs) Yeah. It's. From what I've heard of it, it's quite a laugh. Um, Sure. There's bits of it that maybe, but they're really 
they've they've some people have seen this as um uh Stanley Kubrick admitting that he faked the moon landing. <laughs> um that it's all about the Holocaust is obviously another one. Um that it's about the uh the Native Americans plight. Oh, yeah, oh. I've heard that one. I mean, mm. I mean, I, I, all I could say that I could read into that, that it's about it's about a dark side of a family unit, a family unit that's breaking down, mm. a family unit when it when it breaks down, where it becomes one of the parents becomes violent or abusive, and and that that unit then becomes either threatening or claustrophobic. Mm. That's really what it's about. I mean, beyond anything else, I don't know. I mean, maybe Kubrick didn't even know, but may- maybe he didn't want to know. <clears throat> yeah. Um, What's interesting is that um, a lot of these um, uh, theories come from continuity mistakes in the film. And I think it's almost that you couldn't do this with any other filmmaker's work because people know him as such a perfectionist. That uh, and, and they read into everything that there's a, a chair that's missing in the scene. The, the typewriter changes colour, a few little things like that. And you're like, Stanley Kubrick is not the type of filmmaker to let this slip past. There must be meaning hi- hidden in the missing chair and the changing of the, <laughs> the typewriter and all that. <clears throat> what is interesting, and this this is uh, apparently pointed out in the documentary, is um, Scatman Crudders uh, drives past a, um, a red Volkswagen that's been crushed by a tree. Hmm. Now, in the book... Uh, Jack drives a red Volkswagen. In the film, he drives a yellow one. So it, people see that as a, this is Kubrick's uh, shout out to uh, Stephen King going, This isn't your work anymore, this is mine. Hmm. And, and Jack has a yellow car. <laughs> right. How, how do you feel about the uh, the adaptation from the well, book? Well, see, I only read about a third of the King book because I'm a very lazy writer. Okay. Uh, reader. Mm-hmm. And, um, um, so, it seems pretty similar. But now I do, I do hear that he there were some major changes. But there is no labyrinth in the book, right? <laughs> yeah, but so about, what? Yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, I, I don't like either the well, people that try to adapt a book and it's got to be the same damn mm. thing to, oh God, p- no. to try and please everyone. No, it's two different mediums, uh, and you, then you try and please everyone, and you end up with something that's bland and it's safe. And uh, Kubrick was gonna march to his own beat, and uh, you know, he was gonna do his own thing. He mm. always did. Yeah, and, and that's that's the fun. Of, I mean, it's interesting. I believe they did try and make it again as a uh, TV movie, TV yeah. miniseries, and apparently it wasn't mm. too hot. Uh, and I, and uh, I think, I mean, even when I try to do a Stephen King adaptation, I'm very weary of The Shine because The Shine casts a hell of a shadow mm-hmm. over horror in, in general. Yeah, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and so it's almost you should try maybe. Try and do something different yourself, and try and stay away from it. Uh, mm. So, um, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, we'll finish up there. I, get, I, I always say this at the end. Well, I always say this it's only the third episode, but um, I gave you a choice of three. If you were to throw in one more there, what would I throw be? in? Manhunter. Manhunter. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you an interesting thing about Manhunter. Manhunter was so different at the time. Mm-hmm. It seems funny now. It is part of our popular culture now because it influenced the making of. Silence of the Lambs, Red Dragon, CSI, mm-hmm. it, 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 you know all these shows now. That uh, I mean, back I mean pre nineteen eighty six. I mean, you know, you have a cop trying to catch a killer, basically kick down the door, it'd be a shit out, and that's about it. This wasn't like this at all. This mm. was this was very psych- This was about criminal psychology. This was about forensics. This was you know this was a more a thinking man's thriller. I mean, I, I remember I met someone once, and they said, "Oh, I, I can't watch those kind of films. I don't, I don't mind films about monsters or vampires running those kind of horror films, but I cannot watch anything to do with monsters. serial killers right. or psychopaths." And I think that's interesting, and maybe that that does give the films head because we know there's no vampires out there, out mm. there. Uh, but you know, occasionally there are people out there that are you know in in these kinds of stories, and mm-hmm. that's that's a troubling thing, but it's also a compelling thing that we want to watch movies like this that mm. uh, to try and get a little insight into uh, that kind of a psyche. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks, Bren. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. See ya.